stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people, that they plenteously bring forth the good fruit of works, may of thee be plenteously rewarded through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 1 of hymn 376. <clears throat> joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, praising thee, their Son above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the darkness of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Turn our attention to Bishop Charles Petit McGilvain's Oxford Divinity, compared with that of the Anglican churches on the doctrine, particularly on the doctrine of justification by faith. As it was made of primary importance by the reformers, as it, and as it lies at the foundation of all scriptural views of our Lord Jesus Christ, Bishop of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Ohio. This is 18... 41. Wow, very early. But the track, those have been working hard. Is that the year that Johnny Newman pulled out? Or was it 1845? I need to check on some dates on Johnny. Preface. Whoever may honor this work with their attention will soon perceive that the author <clears throat> is deeply impressed with the grave importance of the errors and the prob probable evil consequences to the church of what is here called, for convenience sake, Oxford divinity. In his view, <clears throat> the vital principle of that divinity, so far as the system is peculiar, is precisely the same of that which may be traced to all the various and gross departures from truth and godliness in the Church of Rome. <clears throat> it was well advised by the principal theologues of the Council of Trent that the Father and Divines of that body should be assiduous and ex exact in their duties concerning the doctrine of justification, because, because all the errors of Martin were resolved into that one point. For, said they, having undertaken from the beginning to oppugn the indulgences, he saw he could not obtain his purpose, except he destroyed the works of repentance, expiatory penances, in defect whereof indul indulgences do succeed. And justification by faith only <coughs> seemed to him a good means to this, to effect this, from whence he hath den denied the efficacy of the sacraments, authority of the priests, purgatory, sacrifice of the mass, and all other remedies for the remission of sins. Such was just, such was the just view entertained in the Council of Trent on that which the whole work of the Reformation was built and by which the whole structure of Romanism was cast down. The doctrine of justification by faith was the master principle of the Reformation. Therefore, by a contrary way, said the theologians of the council, he that will establish the body of Catholic doctrine, in other words, he that would restate indulgences, penances, purgatory, the opus operatum of the sacraments, the authority of the priest's absolutions, the sacrifice of the mass, must overthrow the heresy of justification by faith only. Close quote. In all this, <clears throat> there was the soundest view of the relation of cause and effect. Therefore, have we no question that now, though Oxford divinity is fast developing its real character in, in divers ramifications of overt Romanism, and exhibiting the strongest tendencies to do so more and more, the only explanation needed is to be found in its entire defection from the scriptural doctrine of how a sinner can be just with God. The only 
antidote required is the clear understanding, the faithful teaching, mighty in the war of the Reformation, so feared and hated <clears throat> and libeled in the councils of Rome. Justification by the imputed righteousness of Christ through the alone agency of the living faith. Clearly as the strength of Romanism was known by the English reformers to lie in her errors concerning justification that were not wanting even in their times, those who, for lack of a right view of the relative bearing of this subject on all other parts of divinity, were disproportionately occupied with the manifestations of Romanism, which however evil should have been regarded only as the poisonous issues of that one central source of error in religion where Satan's seat is. To mistake such mistakes, <clears throat> the celebrated reformer Fox referred when in his discourse entitled Christ Triumphant said, it is necessary that this doctrine of justification should be retained and preached in the church, which being of long time hidden from Christians and almost extinguished the heroical and mighty spirit of Christ by the ministry and preaching of Martin Luther <clears throat> hath kindled and raised up again the church. Yet such is the mischief and misery of these wicked days through the subtle practicing of Satan and all Christendom is in an uproar by matters of contentions. And in the meantime, all regard of that which is most principal point of salvation is set at naught. The reformer is evidently referring to contentions about the more superficial parts of Romanism, as if the symptoms were the disease, while its evil heart of unbelief was unlooked. Such has been far too much the case in what has been said and written concerning the system of doctrine which is contained in this volume. Had it been always tried by such an eye as that which searched the heart of Romanism at the Reformation, or that which our Andrews and Hall and Usher and Davenant <clears throat> detected the mainspring of all Romish corruptions in the controversies of their day, we should not have heard less, indeed, of the tendencies of this new divinity to the more manifest heresies of popery. But we should have heard more of the identity with popery in that grand defection from the truth concerning the justification of sinner before God. We have a footnote here. Elsewhere, this reformer speaks, as all English reformers were wont to speak, <clears throat> of the grave and excellent judgment of Martin Luther, the most singular and chosen instrument for setting forth the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> Few evidences of that sad decline in the Church of England from the spirit and doctrine of her martyred reformers, which the 18th and latter part of the 17th century exhibited are more striking than that which appears in the almost entire exclusion from the controversies carried on in those days with Rome of the doctrine of justification. In the days of the Reformation, who would have written upon Popery and not spoken of the doctrine of justification by inherent righteousness as its main and vital principle? Read the solemn confessions of the Anglican martyrs. These are full of protests against this chief corruption. What pains does the venerable Latimer take to be distinct and continual on this head? How does labor, how does Hooper labor it? The controversial works of Haddon <clears throat> in the reign of Elizabeth against the Portuguese divine Osorius written as sort of a state book, as Strip calls it, in defense of the English Reformation and completed by Fox, is occupied in very large part of its pages with the single subject of justification. How much the judicious hooker made of it, whoever has read his discourse 
of justification, can it but know? <clears throat> Such views of the eminent prominence of this subject and all the controversies with Rome continued unabated up to the 17th century. The works of Perkins, a great light at Cambridge and strong adversary of Rome, who died in the beginning of that century, are stored up with it. In Usher's writings, it is a grand topic. <clears throat> Bishop Downham devoted a whole folio volume of controversy with Rome to this one point. The same sense of the great importance of the difference between the faith of the Anglican Church and that of the Church of Rome on this head appears in the works of Andrews, Hall, Davenant, Hopkins, Jackson. But as we approach the latter periods of that century, when it is acknowledged that true religion was greatly on the wane in the Church of England, we find this subject more and more excluded from the controversies with Rome, as if a greater number of Protestant writers were either agreed with her doctrine in particular or considered the objections of Protestants of no great importance. When, however, we have reached the 18th century, wherein it is usually conceded that the spiritual character of the Church of England was at its lowest depression. We take leave of justification by faith as occupying any conspicuous place in the differences between popery and Protestantism. The axe is no more laid at the root of the tree. The great effort against popery is to trim off some of its branches. <clears throat> this lamentable change in the doctrinal character of the divines of the Church of England must be considered as having received one of its earliest impulses from the writings of that learned forerunner, Hugo Grotius. The peculiar views of that author on justification met with favor from Archbishop Laud. Sheldon, after the restoration, renewed their influence. They were rescued from the disgrace of being associated with the rapidly growing irreligion of that age by finding in the main a most learned and vigorous champion in that truly excellent prelate, Bishop Bull. This eminent divine <clears throat> had commenced his studies in divinity under a Puritan and nonconformist named Thomas. Recoiling from the antinomianism which he perceived to be rapidly growing up under the extremes of doctrine to which many of that school had gone. He became a devoted reader of Grotius and Episcopius, associating with those writers the works of Hammond and Jeremy Taylor, wherein he perceived little sympathy with the views of the former on the subject of justification. In the year 1669, he published his Harmonia Apostolica, <clears throat> for the reconciliation of the epistle of St. James with those of St. Paul in reference to that matter. By this work, far more than any other, was the standard of orthodoxy among the divines of the Church of England on justification and its kindred subjects reduced to that low degree which afterwards reigned so widely in the time of the non-jurors and went, which went on debilitating and ex-animating the religion of the Anglican Church. Till in the part, latter part of the last century, by the renewing of the Holy Ghost, there took place the contemporaneous and connected blessings of the revival of true spiritual piety and the return of teaching and preaching of the doctrine of the Reformers as to the sinner's justification before God. <clears throat> but greatly as the antinomian abuses during the time of the Commonwealth, followed by the general languor in regard to religious doctrine, which the excitements of that stormy period had left upon the public mind, and the flood of licentiousness which ensued had prepared the way for 
the gradual reception of such doctrines as were taught by the disciples of Bull, often going beyond their teacher. The famous work of that great master did not appear without arousing the strongest opposition to its doctrines as an abandonment of the principles of the Reformation, inconsistent with the articles and homilies of the Church of England, and essentially in agreement with the vital principle of Romanism. There was presently, says Nelson in his Life of Bull, no small alarm both in the church and out of it, <clears throat> and Mr. Bull's performance, as if the Church of England and the whole Protestant religion were by it in danger. For his departing herein from the private opinions of some doctors of our church was by several interpreted for no less than the departing from the faith by her delivered. Hence there arose in the church no small contention whether this interpretation of scripture were conformable to the articles of religion and the homily of justification therein. In fact, I want to review those homilies. <clears throat> And I think we're doing bull already. I can't bring myself to read it, Lancelot Andrews or Jeremy Taylor. I probably should, but some maintain with our author that it was, some doubted about it, and others outright denied it and contemned it as heretical. There was many a hard censure passed. Yea, there were not wanting then, even men of some eminence in our church, who with all their might opposed him, probably out of a well-meant zeal, and would certainly have overwhelmed him and his doctrine, had it been possible. Thus much is acknowledged by the non-juror, Juring and Nelson, who embraced the full views of Bull. Among the bishops who resisted the influence of those views, <clears throat> was Morley, Bishop of Winchester. Lectures were read against them before the University of Oxford by Dr. Barlow, then Margaret, Professor of Divinity, afterwards Bishop of Lincoln. But the most conspicuous writer in the church against the doctrines of the bull was Dr. Tully, Principal of <clears throat> St. Edmund's Hall, Oxford, a divine of high standing in the university for learning, eloquence, piety, zeal, and usefulness. The writer was amazed at the indifference or insensibility to the interests of religion of many who endeavored to persuade him to decline the controversy on the ground that the points in dispute were matters of comparative unimportance, not worth the risking of the peace of the church while to him they seem to involve the most noble and momentous of all controversies and to put in je jeopardy the very palladium of the Reformation. Under this conviction, he published in 1864 a Latin treatise entitled Justification as Delivered by St. Paul Without Works Asserted and Illustrated. The present... Margaret Professor Gardner Fawcett has followed the example of his learned professor predecessor in having published strongly against the new and enlarged edition of Bull's doctrines as exhibited in the New Divinity of Oxford, while the professor of Regent Professor Re, Regis Professor Divinity, Dr. Hamden, has borne noble testimony to the truth against some of the same errors in a late sermon on justification. <clears throat> Bishop Morley of Winchester, who read it in manuscript with approbation. Therein it is charged that the doctrine of justification as expounded by the author of the Harmonia was properly heretical 
as being contrary in a fundamental point to the testimony of scripture and against the opinions of the Catholic fathers, the judgment of the Church of England, and the determinations of all the foreign reformed churches. The grand question in dispute, the tachronomenon, according to Dr. Tully, was expressed precisely as in the ensuing volume we have stated the main question between popery and Oxford divinity on the one hand and the doctrine of the Anglican church on the other. What is that for the sake of which God, of which God may receive a sinner to grace, may acquit him from the curse of the law and make him heir of everlasting life? A side espoused by Dr. Tully, which was precisely that of justification through faith only by the imputed righteousness of Christ, was maintained by a reference to the ancient fathers, a literal and grammatical sense of the articles and homilies of the Church of England, and the testimony of her most famous divines, such as Andrew and Hooker. The feeble attempt of Bishop Bull in his Apologia to answer the appeal of Dr. Tully to the standard divines of the church and the anxiety of his biographer to claim for him that he should be judged not by the Anglican reformers, but by the ancient church and the holy scriptures are strong evidences how futile, futile was considered in that day the pretense that such doctrine as that of the Harmonia had it received, sorry, let's skip this sentence here. If it shall be the honor of this volume in any degree to revive the attention of the members of the church, especially her clergy and candidates for orders, to the works of the elder divines, such as Usher, Hall, Brent, and I guess I'll throw in Andrews there, but I'm, it's kind of like a pietist to me, as well as those of the age preceding them up to the Reformation, so that the nervous and clear displays of divine truth is there in expound, abounding and is just distinguishing them from that fable, confused, mixed mode of re representing them. And he wants to contrast Anglican writers with Oxford divinity. It may perhaps be considered a great defect of this volume that it does not institute a comparison of Oxford divinity with the scriptures. The author must not be understood as countenancing by this omission, the idea that there can be any approach to a final settlement of Christian truth short of a direct appeal to the inspired word. But all objects cannot be embraced at once. Sometimes the recalling of the doctrine of the church at some particular period may be of more benefit to recall the great principles of the Reformation as illustrated by a comparison with those of the Church of Rome and the Romanizing divinity of Oxford seemed to be the author, to be the precise desideratum at this present juncture and of div dimensions sufficient to occupy a volume by itself. He's fully persuaded that with truly, a truly Protestant communion the most direct refutation of Oxford divinity is itself. Only let it be displayed without reserve. <laughs> Tongue in cheek there by the bishop. Let the system which has been brought before the public so skillfully and reservedly by heterogeneous parts so that it required the skill of a professional anatomist to find out their place in the body and to form from them any accurate idea of the whole framework be set up and seen in its proper aspect. Its work is thus done, its day is ended. The Protestant church is too much alive to the truth 
that Popery is the Antichrist, that man of sin revealed in the scriptures, who poses and exalts himself above all that is called God, and that there is no society of Christians in the world where antinomianism and libertinism reign more than among the papists whose, with whose very faith they are interwoven not to be turned away as shown in this volume is little else than popery restrained contents preface introductory remarks chapter one Oxford divinity before the publication of Dr. Pusey's letter effect of that letter <clears throat> convictions of the present author reasons for this publication the doctrine of justification selected as that by which the Romanism of Oxford divinity may be most thoroughly tried. That this was the great point with the reformers shown from Hooker, three presumptive objections to the charge of Romanism from the character of the Oxford divines removed, <clears throat> the views of the writer as to the designs and snares of Satan. Chapter two. Statements preparatory to the right estimation of the Oxford doctrine of justification. Professions of Oxford divines concerning the conformity of their doctrine with that of the Church of England, their account of ultra Protestantism, the identity of their system with that of Alexander Knox, their condemnation of the latter as Romish and dangerous by certain eminent divines of diverse schools in the Church of England before its development <clears throat> at Oxford had excited any notice. Chapter 3, the doc doctrine of Oxford divinity as to the righteousness of justification exhibited to set forth the precise doctrine of Oxford divinity as to the way of justification, the object of this chapter. The main question as to Romish doctrine adopted here. The great point of inquiry stated the scriptural use of the word justification, two kinds of righteousness asserted by Hooker, Beveridge, and Andrews, <clears throat> only one by Oxfordism. This opens the door to the Oxford divinity of Oxford as well as of Rome. That one righteousness made identical with sanctification. What is meant in this divinity by imputation or counted? Extended proof that it makes sanctification the same as justification. The position in which it puts the cross of Christ, <clears throat> the use it makes of the merits and passion of Christ, its effect upon the consolations of the believer. Singular effort to escape from being identified with Romanism by denying what was asserted as to sanctification and justification, the same in Mr. Knox. This doctrine shown in Osiander, concluding observations. Chapter four, the dox doctrine of Oxford divinity as to the righteousness of justification compared with that of the schoolman. Origin of the Romish doctrine of justification in the self-righteousness of the human heart. Advance until the age of the schoolman. The origin of scholastic theology. Character of the schoolman. Fitness of the age for the rapid growth of error. The corruption of Romanism, which were matured in that age. The seven sacraments. Sacramental confession transubstantiation, half communion, image worship, purgatory, indulgences, the same age as was to be expected, gave birth to the Romish doctrine of justification. Connection between the schoolmen and the divines of Trent, three propositions to show the similarities, concluding remarks. Note showing resemblances between the doctrine of Oxford and that of the early Quakers. <clears throat> Chapter 5, the doctrine of Oxford divinity as to the righteousness of justification 
compared with that of the Council of Trent. Recapitulation, language of the Council of Trent, state of the question at the Reformation, and now from Chemnitz. I'm not sure. Jackson, Hall, Busher, Hooker. Holiness required at least as much by the Protestants as the Romanists. Oxford interpretation of, a, of single passages of scripture compared with those of Romish divines. And here we'll call it to an end. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God speak.